Love it. Love it. Love it. That, that does not get old. You're seeing your dad there at the end, <laughs> holding it up in Hebrew. Love that so much. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome in person. Welcome those of you who are joining us online. My name is Jennifer Richmond. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at La Mirada Church. We're glad you guys are all here with us today. And um, how many of you are ready for June gloom to be over? It's May. It hasn't even like, it was like wet when <laughs> I walked out to the car this morning. Um, there's other things that are gloomy besides the weather. I don't want to bring up a sensitive topic. Well, I do because I, I'm sorry. I just have to. I mean, the angels. I know. I know. I know. I know. I, I'm kicking myself also because the Dodgers are losing right now. I've got the live score up. They had their, their game advanced, so I do. It's on my screen, so I'll try not to be too distracted. Uh, but they're playing early today. They got their game moved up for rain, and uh, it's been a it's been an interesting season for the Angels and the Dodgers. <laughs> Woohoo! Go teams! All right. <laughs> so believe, believe. This is the title of our series that we are going through in John, and it really wasn't that difficult to come up with a title. Sometimes Joe and I go back and forth. What should the title of our new series be? And this one, like, literally wrote itself. We're only six chapters in, and John has talked about believing those who have, those who haven't, those who one day will. 36 times, just to this point, the word and the idea of belief occurs over 80 times in the Gospel of John, more than any other Gospel or book of the New Testament for that matter. And John stated his mission at the opening that all might believe through him in verse 7. And as um, he closed his Gospel, he reminded all of us reading and hearing it why he wrote it down, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So we've been learning about who are true disciples, who are false disciples. And John opened up his gospel with a sad truth in chapter one, saying that Jesus came to his own, but his own threw him a party and said, we're so glad you made it. No. We sang a song a moment ago, how long, O Lord? And then he comes and his own do not receive him. (laughs) The very ones who wrote what that song is based on, the the psalm, how long? He was in the world, and the world did not know him. And our mission, our goal, our heart today should be that that would not be said of us, (laughs) that he is in our world, and we don't know him, right? So for many chapters, we've seen that the Jewish leaders didn't receive Jesus as the Son of God. And at the end of chapter 6, disciples of some kind quote, turned their back and they no longer walked with him because Jesus had difficult and even offensive words that were hard for some to receive. And that whittles this group down. And when Jesus turns to his 12 and asks if they're going to be leaving too, Peter says, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. The belief is simple. And yet it's challenging. It can look clear those who don't, those who do. But really, it's a deeper heart issue, and it has nothing to do with outward appearances. So things are heating up with Jesus, and he's pressing in, and we pick up in Galilee with Jesus and a thinned-out group of disciples. Next slide. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Galilee because the Jews, the Iudeoi, that's a tongue twister, were seeking to kill him. 
Okay, so that short sentence covers about six months of Jesus' ministry in Galilee, goes from April to October. The other three Gospels, they get into some good details about that, some pretty famous passages that you'll be familiar with. And um, you'll hear about what he was doing during that six months. In fact, I'd encourage you to get a Bible laid out called a chronological Bible. I know some of you enjoy reading from that. But a chronological Bible will fill in those gaps and put John and Mark and Matthew and Luke, everybody all together in, in that order when Jesus did it in chronological order. So this after this phrase here is after feeding of the 5,000, we learned about that, after walking on water, after his speech to the crowd of the false and the true disciples saying he's the bread of life, going about in Galilee is where we've been with Jesus. That's up there in the northern areas, Capernaum and Cana. And John gives us the reason that Jesus is staying up in this Galilee area. He's on Israel's most wanted list. (laughs) The Jews, and here the word Jews doesn't mean every Jew possible. It's the Jewish leaders that he's specifically referring to. And they're literally seeking to kill Jesus. And that phrase comes up a lot in John's gospel gospel as well. And so uh, we'll review why they're so bent on killing him in a few verses. Let's get set up with the when and the where, and then we'll get to the why and the what next. And So here's where Jesus and the disciples are up in the north, where you can see on the map of the area of Galilee. And below that area is Samaria. We talked about Samaria a few weeks ago. And then below that is that region of Judea, just to give you the visual. In the middle of Judea is Jerusalem, and in the middle of Jerusalem on a hill is the temple. And chapter 7 opens with the where, Galilee, and the what, he went about walking around. And we know from other gospels that he's teaching parables, and he's healing, he's casting out demons, and the transfiguration takes place. It's a big scene. It's not recorded in the Gospel of John. But that's a lot in that one sentence. Again, I really want to encourage you to go ahead and read those accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke and connect in one of the summer grace groups and find some other women who want to connect with you and do that. So where and the what covered, we also know the when. We know it because it's been six months since Passover. Passover was in April, and he's returned from Jerusalem. He's walked around, he's teaching, he's healing in Galilee. And now, next slide, the Jews' Feast of Booths was at hand. And your Bible might read uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, shelters, in-gathering, maybe tent pitching. Some of you are online. You can look up all the different ways that this is referred to. It's known in Hebrew as Sukkot. There's a good Hebrew word you can learn. Can you say that word? Sukkot. Good. Mm. And the, <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm blowing in my water there. Uh, the reason we know it's been six months is because we know when that feast takes place. It's always in the fall, and it's the last of a series of seven feasts. The seven feasts have been in place for 1,200 years. They were given by God when he delivered his people from slavery. The night before that final plague where God would kill the firstborn of all of creation who don't live under the cover of the blood of the lamb, God explains what will happen, and he gives the people a reminder forever of their new true identity. Now listen, I have a question for you. Do you know what the first thing that God gave his people the night before that deliverance was? It was a calendar. Exactly. A calendar on the next slide. God's calendar to be exact. And it was filled with festivals. And I'll pause right here to let you know also, if you're in the La Mirada group on our app, all these slides are available for you. You can go to the app and look up in, under resources in the La Mirada church group, and it, you can see them there. If you need help doing that and want them ready for next week, let me know or Joe, and we'll help you with that after church. But you can get those slides later. If you're like, hey, I want the, uh, the list of all those the slides will be available for you on our website and on the app. So those festivals are all described back in the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 23. Jesus grew up observing them with his family every year, just like we have observances in America that we do every year. Today is one of them uh, for Memorial Day. So understanding those that cycle of feasts, of festivals, is going to help us to see Jesus' timeline and also kind of help us to interpret and understand what he's talking about sometimes. So here's the appointments on God's calendar, and I've arranged them for this year. Those dates up there are coordinate to this year, uh, 2024. So you can see when each of these events takes place, beginning in April. We had that a while ago with Passover, April 22nd. And John talked about this in chapter 2. Remember when Jesus made that whip and he cleared out 
about the temple. And then in chapter 5, when he heals the lame man, it was on a Sabbath, and it was during that Passover time. And in chapter 6, when he feeds the crowd, the Passover was near, it says, and Passover actually kicks off this whole seven-day observance called Unleavened Bread, which follows that. You can see that on the screen. And the third day after Passover is a day called First Fruits, when people lift up the first fruits of their harvest and they thank God for it. And so once you start reading the Bible with God's calendar in mind, you're going to start noticing things that you hadn't noticed before. And in writing his gospel, John, in making sure we notice the connection between Jesus and these appointed times. So like the miracle of multiplying the bread, well, that takes place during the feast when all the bread grains were being harvested. Uh, the barley and the wheat. And Jesus says right then, I'm the bread of life. Isn't that great? It's like he ties it all into that. And counting first day, 50 days from first fruits then is a, a celebration called Shavuot, when the people celebrated giving the law at Sinai. And they bring in this wave offering of two loaves of bread that are leavened, the squishy kind like Weber bread. Uh, they didn't have Weber back then, but it wasn't a matzah cracker because they had been eating matzah for a while. So they switched over to this these leavened loaves of bread. And um, later that day, Shavuot, and it's coming up, is, is Pentecost. So that, com that comes up on June 12th of this year. And that's 50 days after first fruits. And, and then comes the fall observances. So October 3rd is Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah when the trumpet is sounded and the people are called just to be on alert. And then there's 10 days later on Yom Kippur. And that's a, a Jewish holiday that maybe you've heard of because it's a little more spoken about in, in modern times now, also called the Day of Atonement. And that's the holiest day of the year when everyone's called to repentance. And then there's a final feast. And that happens this year on October 17th. That's the feast called Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles or uh, booths or tents and all that. So three of the appointed times, and this is important to what's going to happen in our passage today, three of these appointed times are called pilgrimage feasts because God commanded that wherever the people live, they would need to come into town. They need to come to Jerusalem to the temple. And those three are actually bolded for you on, on the screen up there. And so it's Passover, Shavuot, or Pentecost, and then Feast of Booths, or Sukkot, we're going to call it. So Sukkot had two purposes. I have more, but two main purposes. First of all, the first purpose was to remember that they were wanderers in the wilderness, and God provided for them as they traveled, and they lived in Sukkah, temporary homes. Sukkot is the plural of, of Sukkah. Before they came into the promised land, they were wandering around. They lived in these little temporary homes. And during that time, God dwelt tabernacle literally among them in a tabernacle that would travel with them for 40 years and that greek word tabernacle is what we see at the beginning of john's gospel and the second thing is to rejoice that the of in the lord because the harvest time is all over by that time so barley's been harvested and wheat and grape and olives and fruits and figs and everything's coming in and they're and they're thankful and the dry season is over i mean think about where that hits their climate is very similar to southern california and it's dry 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 hot and dry and then october comes and they're waiting for the rainy season to begin and even the non-jews to this day will wait and look and see if rain comes on sukkot it's good luck you know, they, they non-Jews know to look for that. And so they praise God. It's a very celebratory time. It's very joyful. It's a pilgrimage feast everywhere in the whole land. Everyone's coming into, uh, tabernacle, into the tabernacle, into the temple. And then the traditions start getting added to these feasts that include a, a tradition called pouring out of the water. And they remember that God struck the rock and the water poured out of it. And then there's this candle lighting ceremony and God commemorates his presence of him being that light in the wilderness for them and all that. Jesus is going to use those traditions and he's going to point the people to himself as water for the thirsty and light for the lost. And that's going to come later. So to this day, to this day, coming up right now in modern day Israel, it's a big, huge party huge party. People are living in temporary shelters. They, it's like camping. All the campsites get sold out this time of year. It's this big, long seven plus one, eight day festival in the harvest. And you can see some photos up here. Uh, I think I have them already. These are just some of them. You can buy a kit now to build your own sukkah. <laughs> so here's some of the photos of, of individuals and then some other ones that are 
uh, the communities coming together. And here is what the Temple Institute describes Sukkot. It says, the rejoicing before God, which is Sukkot, uh, was manifest in the singing and music performed by the Levites in the Holy Temple throughout the festival. Though the Levites sang and played every day of the year on Sukkot, it was especially felt. All right, so now that we have this backdrop of where Jesus is, Galilee, what time of year it is, right before Sukkot, we can understand this next part in John's account even better. Next slide. So his brothers said to him, leave here, remember they're way up there in Galilee, and go to Judea, that your disciples may also see the works you were doing. For no one works in secret if he wishes to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Hey, it's that time of year. We're all going to be heading down for Sukkot. It seems like a really normal idea. In fact, there would have been a lot of men packing it up and heading down. Everybody would have been kind of doing the same thing right at that point. And they've all been headed to Jerusalem because it was required by God's law to be in Jerusalem. And while his brothers are right to want to leave for Jerusalem, they are wrong in their understanding still. They had a worldly idea of Jesus Jesus' brothers, our half-brothers, are James and Joseph, um, Simon and Judah. Um, not Judah Iscariot, that, the bad guy Judah, the, another Judah. Uh, we last heard about them um, back in John 2 at that wedding where he turns the water into wine. And they have a plan for their brother. This place is not where the real action is. Let's leave and let's go down to Judea. Let's get out of Galilee. Besides, it's going to be packed down there. It's a party. It's literally lit. Right? This is the biggest party of the year. There's going to be this huge candelabra that gets lit up, and it's just going to be a great party. They want him to go, though, to prove himself in Judea. If you're the Messiah, you can't stay up here in Galilee. This is a great time for publicity. Don't hide your light under a bushel. The people are thinking about it, and they're hoping for a Messiah. And Sukkot is the big festival where they're like, where's the Messiah? Is he going to show up in the crowd? Like, literally, that's the thing that happens during Sukkot. It's the perfect time to reveal himself as a Messiah. And honestly, it is. It's the perfect time. Perfect time. Everyone's going to already be there. They're already in a good mood. Ta-da! The Messiah shows up. Everyone's partying already. The wine and the water is pouring. It's a great time. So they're thinking about this. All right, if you're doing the works of the Messiah, go show yourself to the world. This sounds like belief. It sounds like they think Jesus is the Messiah and Jesus needs to get the ball rolling and they're just going to be helpful. They sound like they have the plan all figured out. It sounds reasonable. It even sounds inspiring so that your disciples may see your works, which you are doing. Don't hide up here. No one knows, no one does anything in secret who wants to show themselves to the world. But for all their talk, their motives are really off. Does Jesus need to go to the feast? Well, yeah. Jesus obeyed every single law. We know that. And that was a law and it was required. It's the law of Moses, right? So maybe they could have played on that truth. We better head to Jerusalem. I mean, you know. You're so perfect, you know, because he's a big brother and he never sinned. That would have been no pressure at all as a brother growing up with him. Probably how your brothers felt growing up with you. No pressure, right? You're so perfect. So after what had happened in chapter 6, maybe they noticed that Jesus was losing disciples. If you're on the right path, shouldn't you be gaining followers? So if they think maybe if he heads to Jerusalem for this feast, maybe he could gain back some of them and save his family name. They maybe were embarrassed about what Jesus teaching about drinking the blood and eating the flesh. And their advice was based on, though, a failure to grasp Jesus' divine origin and his ultimate mission. And doesn't their advice kind of sound familiar? I mean, it should. We've heard it before. When Satan tempts Jesus to jump off the top of the temple and let the angels carry him to safety so everyone can see and bow before him as the son of God. If you're the son of God, do this. If you're the Messiah, show us. If you truly do these things, go show yourself. So their advice is actually a temptation. It's not that they didn't believe in his miracles, but his brothers, verse 5, didn't believe in him. <laughs> That's a huge difference. That's a big problem. And this is John's mission. That's the point. We can believe in the miracles, but we need to believe in him, who he actually is, not who we want him to be. The miracles were a sign pointing to that reality, but his own brothers wanted Jesus to get to Jerusalem in a public place to be acknowledged before they'd really believe in him. How do we recognize unbelief in our own life? I mean, we should. We should be aware. We use Jesus to get what we want. 
even if it sounds good. And this isn't belief, it's, it's manipulation. We don't use people, we shouldn't use God. So going, sure, that makes human sense. He'd have been part of the crowds of family and friends as they all head there. He's done it before. Famously, when he was 12 and his parents lost him in the crowds at the Passover feast. For now, it's not his time. Jesus is committed to his father's timing. Jesus will, has resolved himself to keep his father's will. Jesus rejects his brother's agenda and in particular their timing. And he says this, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time is not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. That should be problematic when you read it, because you know Jesus kept all the law. So when you read a phrase like this, I'm not going up to the feast, you should say, uh, what? He's supposed to. He has to obey all the law. We know he does. So you should put a pin in that one and go, what? what's going on here? And that should also have made his brothers go, huh? How are you not going up to the feast? You know you have to. He's provoking on purpose. He's getting them to think. Let's hang in there with us. The Greek language has several words for time. Um, eon refers to long periods of time. We say it's been going on for ages and age, ages. That's eon. This is abstract time. It's God's time. Not his timing, but God's time. It describes a lifetime or an eternity. A chronos is another word, chronological, like the, like the chronological Bible I talked about a minute ago. This, uh, our word hour, H-O-U-R, hour, comes from another Greek word for time, ora, H-O-R-A. Jesus tells his mother that his hour has not yet come. Remember that? He turns the water into wine and performs his first miracle. But time in this verse is altogether different time in Greek. It's kairos, A-I-R-O-S. It's a specific point in time. It's a precise moment. It's the right moment. It's the opportune and proper time. And he deliberately uses that word. This is the only instance in where Jesus actually uses this particular word in relation to his own ministry. Why now? Why now? While he's responding to his brothers, when he said, my time has not yet come, he's saying something like, well, I plan to come, but it will be at the exact best time. You can go anytime. You can. Not me. I'm different. I'm on a timetable. I'm on God's time. I'm on God's calendar. And he restates this in verse 8. You go. I'm not going to the feast. Not yet. I'm waiting for the exact time. But sandwiched between his talk about timing is something that he, they hadn't even brought up. Wait. What? <laughs> Did you see that? In verse 1, Jesus already said that the Jewish leaders wanted to kill him. That's hate. The world cannot hate you. Why? Why bring this up right now? You don't testify about its evil works. This lesson must have hit strongly for one of his brothers his brother named James. The world can hate you. It can't. Why? Because you're friends with the world. That's why. James writes later in, in chapter 4, verse 4, don't you know that to be a friend of the world is to hate God? James knows that now. <laughs> he didn't know that back then. But he writes an entire epistle about it. So anyone who chooses to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy. And that's another question we should be asking. Am I God's friend or am I the world's friend? And what does that look like? Help me understand that, Jesus. Help me know that, right? So I'm going to pause here and encourage you to read that book written by James. Read, read the other books written by uh, Jude is the other one. Um, read them in light of this account now. And I promise you're going to get blessed. You're going to be surprised. You're going to say, what? I get it now. Like they were sitting there hearing all this, and then they wrote that. Yeah, they got the point. Before they accepted Jesus as a son, think back to what they had been trying to get him to do. Go show yourself. If you're really who you are, say you are, his brothers at this point in their belief journey actually have more in common with Satan than they do with their own brother, Jesus. They're not on God's time. They're not observing his calendar of feast. I mean, they're observing his calendar of feast. Sure, they're going down there. They want to. But that's them just being out of obligation, being legalistic, observing the holy days. That's what we all do. Plus, it's a party. Woo -woo! You know, Sukkot, it's a huge party, right? They're not in God's true time in their heart, though. Instead, they're still serving their own worldly ideas and superficial judgment about Jesus. Honestly, trying to look spiritual and mission-minded. But they're really still stuck in their own vision. Isn't that what Peter had also done? It's not recorded in John, but in Matthew's gospel records that when Jesus begins to explain his mission, that he'd be killed and on the third day be raised, Peter takes him aside and rebukes him. And, and what does Jesus say in a really shocking rebuke? Get behind me, Satan. He calls Peter Satan. Whoa. You're a hindrance to me. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You get out of my, my sight is here. You get behind me. You know, I don't want you in my sights, right? 
So here with his brothers, they're not rebuking Jesus. They're just prodding him to do something out of step with the perfect timing. And Jesus doesn't bite. <laughs> Instead, he just bids them to get going. They won't face opposition. The world doesn't hate them. Not yet, at least. John's showing Jesus focus on doing the Father's will, not the will of his unbelieving brothers. It's important. It's so important to see that it's possible to be in close relationship to Jesus, but still not truly believe. Jesus' brothers were raised with him, attended the same festivals, heard the same teaching, seen him, heard the account from his mother, but they still missed a mission. You can go to church every week and know a lot about Jesus and actually not believe in him, believe in him. It's tempting to be thinking of someone else in this moment when I say that. Maybe you are like, oh, man, I know. Sharp elbows, right? Point them in. <laughs> be careful. Remember what Jesus had just said. One of you is a devil. Right above that to this nice group of, you know, Jewish boys hanging out with him. One of you is a devil. Like, watch it. Don't think it's not you. I doubt very much any of his brothers, much less Judas, thought it could be them. And yet here they are speaking like Satan. And Jesus is gracious. He doesn't call them out. He doesn't rebuke them. They're, they're speaking like Satan, right? But he just sends them on to the feast. Go ahead of me. While he remains in Galilee until his brothers were on their way. Next slide. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, out of his sight, he could just focus. Then he also went up. Not publicly, but in private. Now remember that Sukkot in Jerusalem would have been packed with people. Like, super packed. More packed than an angel game. Like, crowded. <laughs> It was loud. It was busy. It was partying. It was a celebration. And above the crowds and above all that noise, a good time actually was for Jesus to slip in and just go unnoticed. The men are wearing their prayer shawls in the fringe with the blue and the white, the twisted cords on there called the seat seat. The willow branches are all waving around. The Sukkot huts are being built. The wave ceremonies are getting ready. And the sacrifices nonstop every day. Eight days of sacrifices. Bulls and rams and lambs and goats were sacrificed for a total of 70 bulls during this whole period to correspond to the 70 nations, 15 rams, 105 lambs, and eight goats. It's all recorded in numbers. You can read all about this, and it gets ready for this. Then the Torah was read, and every seven years, the king himself would actually come out and read it. They didn't have an actual true Jewish king at the time. And, uh, and then they would also read Psalms and they would sing Psalms. The Psalms in your Bible might even say a song of ascent. Have you ever noticed that in your Bible? It says songs of ascent. What does that mean? Well, those are the songs that were sung when they were ascending and they were going up to Jerusalem. And no matter where you are in Israel, it's always up to Jerusalem. It always is up, right? Even if you're geographically heading down, it's always talked about ascending to Jerusalem. Those special groups of Psalms are called the Sharim Ma'alat, and they are sung by the children and the moms and the dads and the family and the cousins and everyone's gathering and they're singing and everyone's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful moment. And in that moment, when the water and the wine are being poured out on the altar and the temple lights are being lit, these four enormous lamps are in the court, 75 foot high menorah in the temple, all lit up. The light was so bright that it was said the glow could be seen from Jerusalem all the way up to Galilee. Sukkot was truly lit, like I said. And while all this was happening, Jesus slips in, verse 11, the Jews are looking for him at the feast saying, where is he, where is he? And there's much muttering about him among the people. And the Jews in this passage, again, refer specifically to those leaders who were seeking to kill him from back in verse 1 of this chapter and mingled in with the crowd of the men and the women and the children. These leaders are listening, but no one is clearly saying anything that they can pick up on. Some says he's a good man. Others say, no, he's leading the people astray. <laughs> like all this murmuring going on. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. Like NSA, like they're listening. They're going to use it against me somehow, right? And they would have. The Jews knew Jesus would be there. All obedient Jewish men had to be there. Remember, this isn't just a one-day gathering either. It wasn't just for the men, although they were the ones required. Everyone was there. Everyone came for Sukkot. So while all this is happening in Jerusalem, Jesus shows up. It's a bold and, he, and a fearless move. And he doesn't just show up for the past six months. He's been keeping away, knowing they're trying to kill him. But now, next slide, in the middle of the feast day, so the third or the fourth day when the water pouring celebration would have been happening, Jesus went up to the temple. 
No one's going to miss him there. There's all these steps, and certain parts of the ceremony had to be done on each level of the steps as they ascend up, not only to Jerusalem, but up into that big, beautiful temple. This is before 70 AD, of course, before the temple was destroyed. And Jesus goes up into the temple, and he sits around and observes and checks everybody out. No. He starts teaching like he owns the place. Uh, you know? Yeah. Thank you. For, uh, somebody <laughs> noticed. <laughs> the Jews... Therefore marveled, it says, saying, how is this man? How does he have learning when he's never studied? Now, Jews are stunned by his courage and the content of what he's saying. They got their teaching from other rabbis, all right? You might remember the name Hillel gets mentioned in the Bible. Hillel was one of the rabbis. Paul studies under Hillel. And there was a great sense of pride being able to say, you studied under this rabbi or, or that rabbi. In fact, later on, Paul picks up on this tendency and calls out the church in Corinth for continuing in this kind of behavior. One says they're of Cephas. Other says they're of Apollos. Paul says, knock it off. We're all of Christ and that's enough. And Jesus is speaking with authority, not some rabbi that he studied. He's the all caps rabbi, verse 16. So Jesus answered them, my teaching is not mine. But is this rabbi I heard of, this other area? No, but is his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. He's claiming to be God right here. <laughs> it, it, I'm not teaching my own. It's the one who sent me. If you want to know what God's will is to do God's will, if you want to know this, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. And they're like, well, we should know. We're the ones who should know. So that puts them on edge. Verse 18, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. And that's exactly what all the rabbis are doing all the time. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him, there's no falsehood talking about me. <laughs> you know what Jesus could have said, though? I mean, I thought about this. In the beginning was me, and I was with God, and I was God, and I was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through me, and without me was not anything made that was made. I have come to my own. Receive me. He could have said all of that. They were looking for a Messiah. It's Sukkot. It's the time to look for the Messiah. And John goes and writes, all these things are true. These are all true about him. It's in the very beginning of John. But Jesus is on the Father's time. Jesus is about bringing glory to the Father. And this is how you can be a true disciple. This is how I can be a true disciple. This is how we, La Mirada Church, can be true disciples. Do the Father's will in the Father's time. And how do you know if you're a true disciple? You seek the Father's glory alone, not your own glory. Sin is doing things for your own glory, your own gratification. What you can get out of it in the moment and satisfy yourself for that moment, that's sin. That is not bringing glory to God. We have to be on God's time for God's glory, trying to look spiritual, attending church, even hanging around Jesus and Jesus' people, all the same things his brothers and to some degree even the Jews who were bent on killing him were doing. Disciples love the glory of God. Disciples seek the glory of God. Disciples point to the glory of God, not ourselves. But the surface, by appearances, Jesus looked like any other man from Galilee. He spoke with the Galilean accent. He wasn't just a man, though, was he? And he's going to revisit this encounter next. And he begins by asking a question that they can only answer with yes. Verse 19, has not Moses given you the law? And they're looking at each other like, duh, right? Uh, so basic. Come on, Jesus. Yet none of you keeps the law. Whoa. Why do you seek to kill me? I mean, that's one of the Ten Commandments. Don't try to kill people. <laughs> Don't kill people, period, right? And the crowd amps up and yells in a mocking, shocking tone, you have a demon who's trying to kill you, crazy. Are you paranoid if that was today? Are you on drugs? You're full of it, a demon. And Jesus reviews what happened the last time he was there. This happened six months earlier when he was in town for that first pilgrimage feast, Passover. This recorded in chapter five, Jesus heals that paralytic. I did one work, and you all marvel at it, reminding them of that Sabbath miracle he did in Jerusalem last time he was there. So Jesus will try to yet again to break through their dark and their stubborn hearts. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers, because it was all the way back to Abraham. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? In Leviticus 12, Moses 
gave that law about circumcision, but Jesus reminds them that actually circumcision on the eighth day was a sign of the covenant law well before Moses. That command was a sign of the covenant and it had to happen on the eighth day. What were they supposed to do then? If the eighth day fell on a Sabbath when the law required no work, well, they could go ahead and circumcise. Circumcision, you might remember, was so important that God almost killed Moses over it. Who remembers that? God almost kills, goes for it to kill Moses about. That's how important circumcision is. The Lord seeks to put Moses to death after he had just met him at the burning bush and revealed his I am name to him. It was Moses' wife who steps in and saves Moses' life when she circumcises their boys and the Lord relents. And it had to be done on the eighth day of the life of a baby boy, which means that one in seven times fall on a regular Sabbath day. And on top of that, since there's no, there are uh, seven other Sabbaths that happen during the feast, not just the, Friday, the Sabbath you're thinking about, Friday to, to Saturday. There's seven other Sabbaths that are associated with all these high holy days. You can't circumcise? That's a lot of days you can't circumcise. Jesus uses the point to, to prove that the law of God isn't so rigid in the way we apply it that the Jewish authorities have been making it out to be. If God allows for this work of circumcision to be done on the Sabbath, he would allow for the much greater work of allowing an entire man to be made well. And this isn't the work of a demon. <laughs> the devil seeks to destroy. Jesus made a man well. So how can they be angry with Jesus for healing on the Sabbath? Actually, the question is, who can be angry? And Jesus answers that in this statement, verse 24. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right that's diakos judgment. The hostile Jew setting out to kill him, his own brothers trying to push their timeline and agenda. The false deserting disciples who left him earlier have one thing in common. They failed to judge with right judgment. From the Greek word dikaios, dikaios, meaning approved by God, righteous and just. Those who get it wrong are literally doomed. Literally, Jesus is telling them to judge and to do it rightly. Don't judge on appearances. Eventually, Jesus' brothers would come to rightly judge. They will look beyond the face of that man that they grew up with. And some Jewish leaders would also rightly judge and they would turn from their pride. And John opens up his gospel pointing to Jesus who is among other things, the word that became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. And today we must consider if we are doing what Jesus told that crowd on that middle day of Sukkot, judge with right judgment. It's fitting that Jesus appears in Jerusalem at this feast of the tabernacle Sukkot to begin the end of his earthly ministry. Listen, <laughs> this is going to be his last Sukkot. The word who became flesh, the light of the world who dwelt, who tabernacled among us would in six months be at that next feast day, Passover, and he would become the Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the world. He was the one who didn't seek his own glory, but to glorify the father. And he spoke this prayer moments before he would be betrayed and taken to the cross. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. He had told his disciples that he would die in Jerusalem. Peter rejected the idea, wanted to skip ahead to the kingdom. His brothers tried to manipulate him into their own timeline. The Jews, they tried to kill him on their timing. The Feast of Tabernacles is a reminder that the kingdom will come. But listen, the cross comes first. God gave us his calendar to keep our eyes and our hope and our community focused on that timeline. Join us next Sunday if you're new to Lamarada Church or even new-ish or well, you want some free food. We're going to talk about what this community is about. Be a part of one of the summer grace groups. Be a part of this community. Learn what it looks like here. Jesus tabernacling among us. He dwelt among us. Glory would come first. But I mean, but first the cross. And I know that there are some here today who are longing for that glory, longing for that wholeness, longing for completion in Christ, longing for that day when there's going to be no more sorrow, there's going to be no more tears. And maybe you're tempted to rush the timeline like Jesus' brothers did. So as we prepare to take communion, let's prepare our hearts in prayer that we would judge rightly about Jesus. Jesus is reminding us today to rest in him, wait in him, trust that all things will be accomplished in his time. And as we take the cup, as we take the bread in a moment, can we remember that together? 
Can we come together and thank God for glorifying his son in the perfect time and know that we will be taken care of also in God's perfect time? That day in Galilee when Jesus sat with his brothers, one of his brothers, Jude, was among them. He was one who'd also tried to manipulate their, his agenda into Jesus. Jude didn't yet believe, but he will. And inspired by the Holy Spirit, he wrote this for us today. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, and have mercy on those who doubt. <laughs> now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we continue to praise your name, to be thankful for all that you've done, all that you've accomplished, all that you continue to accomplish in our lives. And we are grateful. We're thankful. Now as we move into this time to take communion, to reflect on your life and your blood and your body, that you lived among us, tabernacled, and then you gave that same body to us so that we could be covered by your blood. Lord, we thank you for that. We want to come humbly in this time of communion and worship before you, acknowledging, Lord, we don't always get it right, but we want to glorify you and we want to do it in your timing. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.